Okay, I think we can begin. So I had a couple of small uh, technical issues getting uh, things set up here, but uh, it's all perfect. We'll give it the best shot we can. So uh, hi, welcome along to the session. Um, I'm Jonathan. Um, you may know me on uh, IRC by doing this simple uh, transformation of my name, and uh, that gets you my nick. So um, my current goal uh, in the world of Perl Things is to try and deal with implementation issues that stand in the way of greater adoption of Perl 6. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of have been building software for, I guess it's been more than 20 years since I wrote my first computer program, and that makes me feel old. Um, but uh, the thing about it is that I've kind of discovered software is a lot about learning. You know, we build software, we talk about building software all the time, but to me, going about building software is a lot about learning about the thing you're building the software for. Um, so I really, you know, very much value um, things that help me get from idea to running code that lets me see if my idea works. And then when I discover it doesn't, that let me transform my code and refactor it into the sort of new thing that I want. Uh, this is kind of why I stuck around with Perl so long. The sort of values of uh, whip uptitude, uh, you know, get it there, and then manipulexity, that is, take it somewhere else, uh, is something that I found Perl has given me very well. It's something that I think Perl 6 really, really gives me. I, I really enjoy coding in that language, and uh, that's one of the reasons I'm so, so passionate to, to bring it uh, into wider use. So, Perl 6, I would say, is probably my learningist project. Um, apparently, English is my learningist language as well. But, uh, you know, when I sort of came into this, um, I kind of started hearing this meme about torment the implementers for the sake of the users, and I thought it was a funny joke. Um, it's actually not uh, really a joke, it's true. Um, the other thing is that uh, I spent my first couple of years mostly learning ways of not implementing Perl 6. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of one of those, those sort of humbling things where you have to sort of say, well, you know, that, that was a, a learning experience, probably a necessary one in many ways. That was years ago, though. Um, by now, we're sort of at a place where we're not really lacking for features. Uh, you know, the vast majority of features are there. Uh, we're sort of talking very consciously these days about, you know, sort of post-6.0 wish lists of things that are out there and, and not really blocking anyone. Um, we're also at a point where we're very happy with the compiler architecture we have. Uh, and in fact, over the last year, as we've done a lot of performance work, it's kind of validated the architecture further. Um, and we have a lot of tests, tens and thousands of tests. We have uh, also, that's just the language tests. We have a module ecosystem that is growing, and we run daily tests across that as well um, with the latest build of the compiler. Um, so we're kind of in a, you know, a kind of nice place by now. Um, and about a year ago, it became abundantly clear that while we'd got a lot of things you know, coming nicely into place, a big sticking point uh, for further adoption has been performance. And you know, the old adage, make it work, then make it fast. And we definitely followed this. One of the reasons it was important to follow it is, as I say, it's been very much a case of learning. If you go and optimize the design that's wrong, you have two problems. First of all, you've wasted time optimizing the wrong thing. Second of all, it's really hard to optimize and still keep the code in a nice refactorable state. It takes a heck of a lot of effort. And with the best will in the world, code as you optimize it often tends to lose some of the, the ease. Um, there's a lot of things where we go caching things. And as soon as you add a cache, you've got a, you know, a situation where whenever you change something, the cache also wants to change. And uh, you know, those sorts of problems start, uh, start coming up. But uh, we kind of reached a point where it was, OK, it's time. This, this is you know, a big problem. So what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, the work that uh, myself and many others have been doing over the last year. I'm going to be looking at the, uh, the things that we've done in the last year. I'm going to, at the end, present some graphs with some of the results. Um, along the way, I'll take you for a deep dive into the topic of dynamic optimization, and we'll have to look at some computer science for that. And uh, I have a little surprise that no one here has seen before that I'm going to reveal at some point in my talk as well. Uh, so uh, lots to, to do. So before we look at the details of the work we've been doing, I need to give you Jonathan's five-minute compiler school. 
Okay? Compilers are actually pretty easy until you actually get into the details, and then they're not very easy. But uh, this is enough just to give you the easy stuff. So um, here's a program, okay? a little Perl 6 program. And uh, we feed it into the compiler. Now, this is text. And as a compiler writer, I think text sucks. What I do with text as a compiler writer is the very first thing I do is I get it out of text form, and I get it into a nice data structure, in fact, a, a tree. We call it an abstract syntax tree, because it's abstracted away from the details of the syntax. Um, we kind of have this more than one way to do it thing in Perl. Um, and this is really fun, because I can't actually uh, see this console on my screen, and I can't see that far. But uh, if I um, was to uh, do, do a, a, say, a, a smart match on a bit of text, does this actually say ABC in quotes? No. <laughs> you know what? I tell you what. Let me ah, forget it. I'll describe it. It's much easier. OK, so if you, if you actually had a situation where you had uh, the match variable, which holds the results of a regex, which is spelled dollar slash, OK, you can do an array index into it. So you write dollar slash and then a zero in square braces. But you can also write that as a dollar zero, OK, the first match. We've actually started numbering them at zero instead of one in Perl 6, just to match array indexes. Now, that bit of syntactic sugar for dollar zero turns into exactly the same tree structure as if you had written dollar slash and the zero in the array index, OK? So this is what I mean by it's abstracted away from a whole load of those little details there. Now, there's another thing that we build up as we do this. And this is one of the things that the earlier designs really did badly. And that is that as we pass your program, there's two things in it that are interesting. One of the things in it that's interesting is the, the sort of executional code. You know, the loops, the conditionals, the variable accesses, the method calls, the operators, all of that. And surrounding it all, there's lots and lots of declarations, class declarations method declarations, subroutine declarations. Every one of those, we actually make an object to represent. In fact, these objects have a really scary sounding name. We call them meta objects. All a meta object is is an object that re represents a piece of your program. So next time somebody tells you meta programming is scary, say, no, it isn't. It's just talking about my program with objects, just like you talk about HTML using the DOM. So we get this tree, and uh, we have these objects, and we feed it into the Perl 6 optimizer. The optimizer basically takes the tree, looks at it, and sort of looks at certain bits of it and says, huh, that's stupid. And then it rewrites it to try and make it into something less stupid. Um, and uh, it sort of spits out a better tree. It might chop bits off or make it happier or something like that. Um, and then all the, the sort of Perl 6 specific bit is over. Um, at this point, it depends what you want to do with what happens next. Basically, the AST goes into one of a number of what we call backends. So for example, if it takes this path, we'll produce JVM bytecode, and we'll take those objects, we'll serialize them, and we'll, we'll stick them in a file that goes with the code in the jar file and package it all up nicely for you um, and uh, spit out the compiled code. Or we might actually just run it straight away if it's a script rather than a, a module. Um, or we might do something very similar on Parrot. We might do something very similar on more VM here. Um, so that's, we, we call these things backends. And basically, the way they work is they, they sort of take this high-level AST, which is all about loops, if statements, and so on, method calls, whatever, and turn it into much more low-level things. So you know, there's no while once you get down to this sort of tree. There's only goto. But goto is awesome, so it's fine. Carl's got to talk about goto being awesome. I can't wait to see the, the, the justifications. OK. Now, one of the sort of big shifts in the last year um, actually has been that you know, a year ago, most people who are running Recudo Perl 6 were doing so on top of uh, the Parrot backend. These days, pretty much everyone is running on one of more VM, um, which is a VM built specifically for Perl 6 and NQP, or they're running on the JVM if they have reasons to do so. And their reasons might be things like um, 
they, they have a deployment requirement on the JVM, or they want to take advantage of its more robust threading uh, model, um, or they just like really lo waiting long for things to start up so they can go make cups of tea or something. Now, I, I just want to sort of put a few words in at this point about the, uh, the thing that's happened here. And um, in many ways, we could not have got to the point with the Rakudo project that we have today and the point we have with Perl 6 today um, if it hadn't been for uh, being able to build those things on Parrot. At the same time, it became very clear um, that if we wanted to move beyond where we were in, in some fairly significant areas, um, we really were going to, to have to sort of look to things like, say, the JVM, particularly to explore the concurrency aspects of things, um, and uh, more VM to actually try and, and get something that, that could really sort of dig into Perl 6 uh, code semantically and uh, do a lot of the efficient execution stuff. And I'll be t showing you some of the things that we've been able to do as a result of this. Now, there's two other pieces uh, of, uh, of sort of infrastructure that I just want to talk about very briefly. One of them is what we call the core setting. This is where all the Perl 6 built-ins go. The cool thing about this is it's written in Perl 6. Okay, so someone actually asked me over dinner last night, um, you know, well, what, what you know, is Perl 6 uh, written in? And uh, the answer in a large degree for the built-ins is, oh, it's written in Perl 6. This is the plus plus prefix operator. That's what it looks like in Perl 6 code. It looks a little bit funky because it's got this NQP colon colon thingy, which is a call down to a low level primitive operation. In this case, it's the one that adds uh, a big integer to another big integer. Now, the other thing that we write a lot of the code in is uh, a small dialect of Perl 6 called NQP, not quite Perl 6. NQP is uh, actually quite nice to work in, but it's a lot, lot simpler. It's a lot, lot easier to optimize. Um, and then you might say, what's NQP written in? And the answer is, well, it's written in itself. Now, where have we... Uh, you know, put NQP in this picture. Well, actually, we reuse most of the infrastructure, okay? So it's a compiler for a small Perl 6, which builds exactly the same kind of AST, just a bit simpler, because the language is a bit simpler, has its own optimizer, because the rules are a little bit lighter and easier, um, but everything beyond there is exactly the same. Now, one of the things that, you know, when you look at this big picture, you can see there's a lot of pieces. And uh, your question might be, well, where do we start optimizing? Um, you know, where do we, we actually sort of, um, you know, begin to, to sort of improve things? Well, one of the really sort of key things that we've had to do is take what I call a holistic view. We've had to actually look at the whole stack. And we're kind of fortunate to have various people on the team who are quite good at being able to know that, you know, this thing all the way up here in Perl 6 corresponds to something like this at the very low level. Uh, a lot of what I've been worrying about is exactly this sort of thing. Um, but uh, the general answer is that uh, we've been optimizing basically every piece. And just to give you the overview picture, you know, so we've been improving things like Recruiter's optimizer. So that when we take your Perl 6 program, we can find the bits in it that are not as efficient as they could be and actually replace them with more efficient things. We've done the same for NQP, apart from we've been a lot more aggressive there because we've got a lot sort of more leeway in what we can get away with. We've done uh, a whole bunch of work on the grammar engine. Now, the grammar engine is the thing that is used to pass Perl 6 but it's also used for your own regexes and grammars as well. So when we make this thing faster, we not only get to pass Perl 6 programs faster, but we get to run the grammars that you've written yourself a bunch faster as well. Um, so we kind of get two for one in there. It's kind of nice. We've improved all kinds of things about the tool chain. Remember that, is that tree I told you about? We can construct that a lot more efficiently now. Um, we've improved lots and lots of things about the built-ins. And that's kind of nice, because you only have to know about Perl 6 to work on improvements there. Um, and then finally, we've done lots of stuff down at the VM level as well. Now, I can't talk about all of them in uh, detail. So I've picked two that I think are kind of the most interesting. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the things that we've done in the Rakudo optimizer. And then I want to take you on a nice tour of uh, the lower level optimizations we do in more VM and uh, 
that there's some, uh, some really fun stuff in there. Okay. So, let's just look at a few simple examples of what the optimizer might do. So imagine I ride a for loop over a range. What can we do with this? Well, if we actually run this code, what we would do is we would construct a range object. Actually, we might do that at compile time, just out of uh, it being a constant in this case. But otherwise, we construct a range object. And then we take this block here, and essentially we call map. We actually turn for loops into maps, um, sort of with, with some slight hand waving. Um, but uh, you know, that's OK, but it's, it's not quite as efficient as you know, something simpler we might imagine, which is to simply actually turn it into a really boring while loop. Okay? And that's actually what we do. And you'll notice here that we even go so far, because we know the upper bound here, of using a native integer there, which is actually an integer which corresponds down to a CPU register integer once we go JIT compiling this thing. Okay, so that can actually be, be fairly speedy. Here's another example where we, we take some code that if you naively run it, means you have to do a hash lookup and turn it into something that doesn't have to do one at all. So this exclamation mark is like a, a private method call. So if we're calling a method itself dot something, if it's a private method call, it's self exclamation mark, this thing. Now, private method calls, like all private objecty things in Perl 6, are not virtual. What that means is we can look at this call and we can say one of two things. We can either say the method definitely exists, and we can just resolve it at compile time and just reference it directly and not do the hash lookup. How cheap is a direct reference over a hash lookup? Well, actually, in the best case, if we JIT compile, a direct reference might boil down to a single CPU instruction. I like it when I can talk about things in terms of CPU instructions. That's when I know we're getting somewhere. So, oh, there's one more thing we do, by the way. If you call a private method that doesn't exist and you typoed it, the analyzer trying to optimize it will uh, say, oh, it isn't there. And then we'll tell you at compile time you typoed your uh, private method call. That's nice. OK, yeah. Actually, um, the optimizer in uh, Recuda will tell you quite a few things that you've done wrong in your code, because it's trying to prove properties about your program. And sometimes it accidentally proves your program is broken beyond repair, and you have to change it before we'll even bother trying. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we, we detect a few things for you. OK, let's look at this method. Um, this method here um, looks very simple, but actually, every routine you write has a few special or magical variables. For example, it has a dollar underscore. That's always lexical in Perl 6. It has a, uh, a dollar exclamation mark for the error, and it has a dollar slash for the match object, the slash reminding you of the slash in a regex. The other thing is that methods always take a uh, slurpy hash. The star means slurp, the percent means hash, and the underscore is just a name. And the reason it does this is because if you're inheriting, we tend to use name parameters for configuration-y things, so we just swallow any up uh, so that you know, if we, we sort of defer to a method in the base class and pass on name parameters, and then we're actually only interesting for the subclass, we don't sort of end up blowing up in the, uh, the base class. Um, now, the trouble with that one is that, uh, well, here we actually have these three lexical variables that are going to need some space allocating for them. Um, we lazily make the scalar containers, which is one of the other improvements we've done in the last year, but it's still a bit annoying. This one is really annoying because we actually have to make a hash. So we allocate a hash, and then we throw it away, Okay, which is, is really wasteful. Um, so uh, what does the optimizer do? Well, the first thing it does is it just looks at this code, and it says, you know, there is no way that you could ever, in this code, use these magical variables. So it just deletes them. And then it also looks at it, and it says, well, what about these, uh, these parameters that are coming in here, OK, the Slurpee? And it'll say, well, there's no way you could possibly use that either. We can just look at it statically and say you're not using it. So we, uh, we kill that off as well. There's various other things we do. So that method, because it's a method, takes uh, self as a parameter. 
we don't actually store it as a lexical after optimization. We store it as a local variable. Um, this has various consequences um, in terms of optimization. In fact, both MoreVM and the JVM can have a much easier time once we take local uh, lexical variables that naively have to be put in sort of a, uh, a data structure that can live beyond the call frame because of closures, and we say, well, a closure never gets it. So we'll just turn it into a much cheaper local variable. So uh, we do all those sorts of things as well. Here's a final example just to show you another sort of transform that saves surprisingly much. You saw, if you came to uh, Lichkin's talk earlier, junctions, OK? And this is kind of nice. I've got the variable A here, and I want to keep looping while it's below two limits, OK? I can say while A is less than limit one and limit two. That's not bad. The problem is that if we just take this code and compile it as it's written, as the, you as the programmer wrote it, you know, what we'll actually do is we'll construct a junction object here. And then we'll take the junction object, and we'll actually have this operator sort of threaded through it, if you like. And uh, that involves quite a few calls. It actually means the optimizer later on would have a hard time taking this and sort of flattening the less than into the, the body of the code. So what we actually do is we turn it into the thing that you would have written in, uh, well, probably in Perl 5, actually. Um, we, we actually just store that thing in a temporary uh, so we don't evaluate it twice, and then we just turn it into a normal short-circuiting AND and that compiles much cheaper. Now, one thing that you, know, you might wonder, as I've shown you all of these, is I've shown you the program text. So I've shown you the program look like this, and then we turn it into this. This is not how we actually do it. We do it all on the AST. Because if you start trying to manipulate programs using the text, then things get very bad, and it might destroy the universe. OK. So, Let's talk a bit about MoreVM. MoreVM started life, as most VMs do, as a naive interpreter of bytecode. So we took a program in Perl 6, we turn it into some kind of bytecode, we feed it to the VM, OK, and uh, it just goes and uh, sits in a big switch loop. And then it sort of does things like this, OK? So here's the native integer add instruction. So it says, well, get the uh, two operands, add them together, and stick the result in here. And uh, it's not very hard to, to write an interpreter like this. It's uh, the, the first thing you do. Now, let's just take a little bit of a, di a deep dive into the bytecode you get if you take something like the prefix plus plus operator and compile it. This is what we get. And you're probably looking at that like, oh my word. So let's take it apart into pieces. OK, the first bit. So we can see that we're meant to just get a single argument passed. So the first thing we do is we check that the arity, that is the args coming in, are just one of them. OK? Next up, we grab that first argument, the 0 of 1, into register R1. Now, because we might actually have this Perl 6 code being called from, say, NQP code, uh, which has a different representation for integers, we might actually just want to first coerce it to make sure it really is a Perl 6 uh, int before we go any further. OK, so we have that. Next up, notice the code contains a type check here. $A has to be an int. So what are we going to do? We're going to uh, take $A out of its scalar container, so we can talk about the actual value, not the, that, not the container itself. We look up the int type. We sort of uh, descalar it, though that's actually a little bit, um, it's, it's sort of done as a conservative thing. We, we don't actually need to in this case. Um, we then do an is type, which does basically what you'd imagine. It checks if the type is actually int. And then we just do an assert param check. And uh, all this is type does is it puts a 1 or a 0 in there. If this gets a 1, it does nothing. If it gets a 0, that's going off and generating a nice error message about why you couldn't call the thing with uh, the wrong type. You'll notice there's a call on D in there, which also means that it's not just meant to be an int. It has to be a defined int. So we don't have undef in Perl 6. We have lots of undefs. Every type is an undef. Okay? And, uh, that actually uh, is done with is concrete, and again, we assert param check. So at this point, we've figured out if we got the right thing. Now we can actually do some work, okay? So we bind it into a register that was uh, 
corresponding to the $A storage. We assert that we didn't get any name parameters by surprise. And then uh, we have to do this. I, I'll skip over what we have to do there. Um, it's to do with uh, iterator over, over call chains. But uh, here's the real work, OK? This corresponds well to the code. So we decont, that is, take the thing out of the scalar container to get the value. We pull the one and the int from the constant table. We do the add at last, <laughs> OK? And then uh, we take that, the superstitious decomp there, we uh, assign it into the scalar, and then we uh, return, and we, we never return the scalar itself. We always decomp it again if it's not an RW routine. Now, you're probably looking at all this code for doing a plus plus, and you're saying, yeah, of course it's going to be a bit slow. Um, so uh, we could improve the code generation in a few ways. The problem is that if we just statically improved it, what we'd actually take out is a few of the silly copies that we maybe didn't need to do. We wouldn't take out things like parameter checks or type checks or all of those things. And they're the more costly things. So how can we deal with those? Well, earlier on in the year, we got a, a new subsystem in the VM. Uh, we call it a type specializer. And I didn't want to just spell it spec for short, and I didn't want to type specializer and type it every single time. Um, so we ended up calling it spec, so that if you say it out loud, it's sort of like specializer. Um, so uh, I mean, it also means we've got a unique name for it, so everyone knows sort of, you know, we're not talking about the spec. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a cunning bit of naming to, to make sure that we, uh, we get rid of ambiguity. Now, what does this do? Um, it's a little bit like a heat-seeking missile, apart from it's uh, a heat-seeking optimizer. OK, what it does is it watches your code. And if we're doing plus plus a lot, it says, oh, that code is really popular. We run that a lot of times. Let's see if we can invest some time in making things better. And what it does is it also says, what type of value do we give to plus plus? And in this case, it'll say, well, it's always receiving an int in a scalar container. So what it'll do is it'll make a specialized version of the code just for that particular case. <laughs> now, the first thing it does is turn it into something called single static assignment form. Single static assignment basically means that you only ever assign to a variable once. It's a beautiful representation of a program because it makes loads and loads of traditionally hard things very, very easy. And the way that we do the transform is we basically just give variables versions. So here we use register one. Here we set it again, and we're just going to say this is version 1 of register 1, and this is version 2 of register 1. Now, you might be saying, what happens if there's loops? Uh, because then it gets really fun, and then the answer is yes, it does get really fun. That's what makes SSA actually quite hard to compute, and you do it by computing something called dominance, which is just awesome. Um, so, well, now I've got my program like this. OK, let's consider the case where we call it with an int. How will we change it? Well, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw away the check of the arity and the check for the name parameters. Because when I specialize code, it's always for a certain call site. Okay? It's always for, say, um, we're receiving a single object that's an, uh, sorry, a single argument that is an object. So I can just throw those away. I don't need them anymore. Next, whoop, not that many slides. Wow. Okay, next. We can do this. We can look at this, and we can say, OK, um, we know we're receiving an object. Now, that first param required positional object actually has to go and check in the slow code, um, are we getting an object, or are we getting, say, a native integer, and we need to box it. But when we're specializing, we know what we're getting. And because we know what we're getting, we can emit a much cheaper argument retrieval instruction. Actually, we use this same technique so that when you pass parameters by name in Perl 6, once we specialize them, we actually access them by index. So passing name parameters once your code is hot and specialized is actually as cheap as passing positional ones, pretty much, which is kind of nice. There's no name comparison anymore. We, we, we take it out of that. Next, we know that uh, we're actually getting a Perl 6 int coming in, so we throw away that check as well. We just turn it into a set. That's a nice way to get rid of an instruction. We also know that the int type doesn't need to be taken out of a scalar container. It's not in one. 
So we'll throw that away as well. It's just a value already. Now here's where things get really good fun. We know that the incoming argument, if you trace R42 back, it traces all the way back to R11, the argument we got in, is actually an int. So basically, this line of code, with all the things we know now, boils down to, is an int an int? Um, I think I know the answer to that. So what we do is we replace the type check with a constant 1. We do the same with the concreteness check. We know we really got an int in, so we just turn that into a 1. OK, it's true. Now, remember I said that a cert param check checks if we uh, actually got the things that we, we wanted in. And uh, if it gets a 1, it does nothing. OK, since it does nothing, I can throw them away. And then if you look at the code, this is unused. This is unused. This is unused. All of that's unused. Now we just get rid of it. OK? All dead. All dead code. So, uh, whoa, this thing has a life of its own. So uh, what we go from is all of this to uh, this. Now, if we took things a bit further and uh, actually worked on some of the, the slightly cheaper things, um, I, I sort of just hand optimized it to show you what I think the best we could do is, and uh, it basically gets down to that. Okay. Now, what we do have to do, of course, is check if we're allowed to use the specialization. And you might be starting to see that this is great. We'll interpret a lot less instructions, but it still sort of sucks because every time we do a plus plus, we have to quickly ask, is it an int? Okay. So what we actually do is we take a call like this, and we specialize it too, because we know we have an int. So this is the naive code. Okay. It, it looks up the lexical prefix plus plus. It does a get lex to get the lexical that we're going to increment. And then it passes it along to that function. But what we actually can do is we can cache the lexical lookup. OK, we're just going to do it once. The plus plus operator in the built-ins is not going to change. Then we turn the invoke instruction into one. This zero here identifies the zero specialization. OK, we might produce multiple of them. And we identify directly which one we want, meaning we never have to check any of those guards again when we call this. Then we can go even further. Then we can take that code for prefix plus plus, and we can say, why are we even going to the cost of making a call frame for it? Why don't we just flatten it straight into the place where we call? So instead of setting up a call, and making the call and getting a value back and getting the return value, let's just take the body of that optimized prefix plus plus and just splat it where the call was. So we've just turned a Perl 6 multiple dispatch to the plus plus operator into nothing at all, just, just a, a bit of code that does the increment. Now, one other thing that you might be wondering, as I told you that Spech is like a heat-seeking optimizer, OK? And I told you that we watch how many times you call things. So if you call it like 10 times, we might start getting interested in it. It depends how big it is, OK? But this loop, it'll definitely optimize the plus plus, but we're in a loop here. How do we ever actually opt get to optimize the loop itself? Because we never call the main program lots and lots of times. We only are in it once. Well, it turns out that we also watch loops. And we watch how many times you go around the loop. And then we do something terrifying. We pause the code. We build optimized code. If we resized things, we on the fly resize the call frame to hold any of the inline things. And then we basically swap the code out under the interpreter and put in the optimized version. And then we set it interpreting again where it was. Except that actually we can also, when we resume, say, you know what? I'm not going to resume in a interpreted version. Okay? Because if you think about it, we're still interpreting. Okay? We're still going through this loop in C. What we'll actually do is, uh, thanks to a wonderful Google Summer of Code project and by, uh, by Bart, who's some somewhere in here, wave. Well, yeah, hello, hello. This, this guy has done awesome work this summer. Give him. <laughs> uh, it's, it's been really awesome. OK, and what we actually do is we take the special output and we now turn it, can turn it into x64 machine code. OK? 
How much difference does all of this make? Quite a bit. Okay. This top one is the naive interpretation. Next down is with spec. Okay. The next one is spec and inline, where we actually inline the operators. And then this bottom one here is the JIT. And you can see it's less than a fifth of the time that it used to be. Okay. And we can go further than this. As I said, the code that spec is producing isn't as good as we could do yet. Um, I think we can probably do a bit better in the JIT as well. Um, and uh, the, there's a set of other op options we have. So uh, you know, this isn't the end of the journey, but it's, uh, it's a, a significant chunk along the way. Now, one thing you might be thinking at this point is this all seems really magical. How will I ever understand what you know, the VM is doing to my code? And uh, what I'd like to do is just uh, share with you something I've been working on kind of quietly over the, uh, the last week or two. And uh, I have to reveal that we now have a uh, special aware, JIT aware, OSR aware, inline aware profiler. Let me just very quickly show you <laughs> some of what it does. So this is kind of tiny, isn't it? So this is the sort of thing that it tells us um, straight off. Okay, What it actually tells me here is that it spent most of its time executing code, a little bit of time doing garbage collection. And it tells me it spent most of its time in JIT compile frames. What we're looking at here, by the way, is that plus plus loop that I showed you uh, a moment ago. Now, what really is annoying is that I can't actually see where my mouse is. Oh, I can just about see it. OK, fine. So here we actually get to see um, where we spent time. Actually, let me make that a bit, bit bigger again. OK, so what I can see here is that uh, this frame here, which is the mainline program body, OK, is uh, actually been OSR'd. So we can see that there. And if I actually take a different view, which is the, uh, the routines view, the core graph view, sorry, then what I can actually do is I can drill down. And uh, what I can actually see here is that we had prefix plus plus and the less than or equal to operator. How big can I make that? That's a bit better. We had these two, OK, plus plus and less than. We called them 100,000 times. Pretty much all the time they were jitted. We can see how long we relatively spent in them as well. And then just off the, the edge, if I zoom out again, we can see that we actually inlined them. OK, so almost all the calls were uh, inlined. So there's a whole load of sort of treasure trove of information in here. Um, and uh, actually, ooh, um, I don't have time to go through all of these, but uh, there's some, some kind of cute things we can do. So for example, um, where is my mouse cursor? Damn it. It's <laughs> there it is. Um, this is the technical problem. I can't actually see the same thing on my screen here. OK. so. Uh, we can actually sort of see um, inside of this what, what was hot, but we can also actually see um, what objects we were allocating as well. So I can actually see what the most popular kind of objects to, to allocate were in a certain program. This is a different program that's a little bit more interesting. Um, this is actually a JSON parser. Okay? And uh, when I actually looked at this profile, I got kind of surprised. Because why are we allocating so many boxed strings and boxed ints? And uh, actually, I can, can go and uh, blame, figure out what is to blame. Uh, I can actually sort of view over there the, uh, the guilty party and, uh, and figure out sort of what, uh, what is to blame for that. The other tab that we have, damn it, I really, where is my, oh, it's a wrong screen. OK, the other thing we have is uh, this rather pretty display here. This is telling you what the garbage collector did. It's telling you how long garbage collection took. So we can see that this garbage collect here took, for example, uh, 4.58 milliseconds. Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's a fairly typical time. And what we can see here is actually that uh, what we have is that we call it a generational collection. So every time we basically fill up a buffer we call the nursery, then we go through and we say, 
what objects can we just throw away because they're unused? Those are the ones in green. We can say what objects need to live longer and we're pretty sure they're going to stay around for a long time. That's what you see there in yellow. That's called promoted. And uh, those are sort of out of the way. So the yellow plus the green is the space we reclaimed in this buffer. And the red is what we sort of held on to in the buffer. Basically, we let objects get to a certain age. And then we say, if they live this long, they're probably going to live for a long time into the future. And every so often, if I, I don't actually have enough in here, if I got down to like 25 or so, we'd actually go and do a full sweep over the, uh, the entire heap and kill those as well. Um, but uh, we, we, we'll actually be able to look at this data and uh, tune all kinds. Um, one of the other ones that I have is uh, probably not that one. I have one for uh, Rakudo Startup as well. Um, I think that is the one. Um, no, I'm not sure that's the one. We, we have one for Rakudo Startup. Um, uh, needless to say, from the information I've discovered while looking at this, um, the next Rakudo is going to start at least like 30 or 40% faster because we're doing some really stupid stuff. <laughs> That's how you run it, by the way. Uh, I, need to, I will get push this right after the session, okay? And uh, you'll be able to, to grab latest and uh, start exploring. So I expect you'll be seeing lots of uh, stuff coming out of this. This one is interesting for us building the compiler. It tells us how the compiler does as it compiles code and lets us profile the compiler. OK. Is that a, that's a sign. Five minutes. OK. So what I'd like to finish up with is uh, just looking at some of the status that we're at now. Just looking at some graphs that kind of compare um, where we were a year ago. So the best. Rakudo you really could get a year ago was Rakudo on Parrot, uh, and that's the date of the release we had a year ago at the last YAPSI. This is the release that happened yesterday. Okay, my stats are actually from about the day before the release or so, um, and uh, we'll compare it to uh, Perl 520. Now, all of these graphs came out of a wonderful tool called Perl 6 Bench. Um, I wasn't involved in writing this, so this is at least somewhat impartial. Um, and uh, it includes a tool for doing the benchmarks and graphing them, but it also includes a really nice and growing suite of benchmarks, too. And if you run some Perl 6 code and find something really slow, if you can turn it into a benchmark, that's a really great way to contribute. OK, because then we've got an idea of, you know, OK, this is slow. Let's look into it. So let's start out with the good news. There's good news. There's OK news. There's still some bad news. Here's a bit of the good news. This line here. The colors are going to be consistent. That is the current latest Rakudo release with JIT enabled. This one below is Perl 5. This one down here is the best we could do last year. Um, this is a native integer loop. Thanks to the JIT compiler on the box I tested this on, we beat Perl 5 by a factor of 14 on that one. That's 355 times faster than we did it a year ago. <laughs> I <laughs> I wish they were all this good, but I had to start with this one. OK. This is a, uh, essentially a native while loop doing string concatenation. Um, again, we've caught up an awful lot here as well. Uh, that one's 45 times faster than last year. That, that's just a little bit off Perl 5 still, but it's, it's not bad. That's not a blocking, blocking thing. Um, our built-in trim method actually basically matches now the idiom for uh, you know, over in Perl 5 that you'd use. So we're, we, we've caught up there as well. We actually support rational numbers directly in Perl 6. Um, and partly because of that, because there's, there's no sort of library for that, that's, that's a built-in thing, um, we actually ace those as well. Um, we're, we sort of got quite a lot faster than those. Uh, so uh, that's, that's another place that we're, we're kind of winning out. So if you need to do rational number math, uh, that's great. I don't think we're jitting those things particularly well yet either. So there's, there's further improvements to be had here. What about that loop I was talking about that the uh, type specializer was working on? That one is still about four times slower than Perl 5. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, what's so hard about this loop? Well, let me tell you a couple of things about what this code actually is. That zero there is actually an object. Okay, it's a big integer object. We do some tricks to not go to the full effort of allocating a big integer data structure, 
but still it's something that can always be promoted and grow arbitrarily. So in general, we need to treat these things as something that could become a big integer. The second thing is that they're objects, and we don't actually have a way to deal with that yet. There's techniques, but we're not doing those yet. So that's really the reason it's slower. One sort of silver lining in this being four times slower, though, is that in the time it takes Perl 5 to do plus plus four times on a native integer, because uh, everything is basically native in that sense. We're not allocating there uh, for, for ints. Um, but uh, every time uh, Perl 5 can do that uh, four times, we can allocate an object in memory and garbage collect it. Okay? Uh, and I think we can do better on this as well. Um, we actually can apply a technique called escape analysis where we can turn that into something that doesn't allocate at all on the heap and just uh, escape and analyzes it uh, to a stack. So uh, that's a, a nice one. OK news, uh, hashes. That one's 57 times faster than last year within three of Perl 5. Again, I think we can do well. When I looked at what was going on in this with a profiler, we're not jitting it uh, as we should be yet. So uh, there's, there's something that we can do there. In fact, the real point of bad news is mostly about arrays. Um, and you know, this one here is, is pretty, pretty awful. That one's, that one's about 13 times slower. Um, this one for push is horribly slower. It used to be 3,600 times slower than Perl 5, which is just ridiculous. Um, now it's still 34 times slower, and I still think this really sucks, um, even though it's two orders of magnitude better. And you might say, why are arrays so hard? And the answer is that actually Perl 6 supports lazy lists. This is a really nice thing. It means you can do things like a for loop over I.O. from a file handle, and you can map it and grep it, and all of those nice things. However, the cost is that um, all of that laziness, when we don't actually need it, uh, gets quite expensive. Um, now, one of the things that's being worked on at the moment, actually by Larry himself, is pushing a lot more information about eagerness deeper into the operations. So we've actually seen improvements um, taking things from a, you know some, some sort of factor of 100 slower to like 10 slower uh, within the last couple of weeks on this. So this is something that's getting a lot of attention now. And I think that you know, within the next few months, um, we'll be seeing much, much better array performance. The other thing on arrays is that once we get support for natively typed arrays, we'll be able to JIT all the accesses, which means that we'll start seeing those sort of 10 or 14 times performance improvements for native arrays as well. And that's going to be pretty nice. And very final graph before I finish this up, OK? Just to show you that over time, this is the January release, February, March, April, May, June. Oh, no, there's, there's probably one missing in there. But this is the one that went out yesterday here. And you can kind of see that we've steadily, over the, uh, the year, been uh, improving. And we have a lot of graphs that look like this. OK. So just to, to wrap this up, overall, uh, we've made a lot of big steps. Um, I think performance is much less likely to be an adoption barrier now than it was. Um, we've got some strong areas that are very promising, particularly the jitted native stuff is going to be a really great thing. Um, we've got some weak areas as well, uh, still, of course. But uh, you know, the future, I think, is looking pretty good, particularly now we've got the, the uh, profiling tools that's a new treasure chest of information. We're going to mine that for all we can, and uh, we'll be able to hopefully extract a heck of a lot more improvements from that as well. Um, but we're, we're really doing a lot of the more sophisticated dynamic language optimizations uh, now in more that you find in engines like, say, V8 uh, or the JVM with Invoke Dynamic. Um, but it's something that we have in the community and can, can sort of grow as we need it uh, to suit our language. Finally, I'll just say this hasn't just been a year of performance work. There's been epic progress in a lot of areas, too. Um, one of the big ones has been a concurrency and asynchronous and parallel things. And I'll just sort of leave a note here saying I'm doing a session on that on Sunday. Um, it's uh, it's going to be a lot more user level than this one here. We dive down to the goods. So uh, on Sunday, I'll show you some, some nice pretty code for doing uh, higher level things. Uh, and uh, that should be fun. But we've, we've had a, a pretty good year progress-wise. 
and uh, you know you you may like to uh, to grab it, check it out, play with it, uh, see if it's uh, it's meeting your needs. And uh, if you find something way slow, you know, please send us a benchmark uh, so we can uh, can keep making things better. I'd love to do questions, but I think I was out of time a few minutes ago. So I'm around, you know, today, tomorrow, pretty much all of Sunday. So uh, just hunt me down. Uh, other than that, thanks very much for listening. I hope it was of some interest. And uh, thanks for your support of the work we do.